Hello, and a very, very warm welcome to everyone. I'm Tina Altieri, your moderator for what is shaping up to be an incredibly insightful, dynamic, and important session today. And it's great to have so many of you join us today. You know, for 15 years, World Contraception Day has taken place every single year on September 26th as part of the global Your Life campaign, which really pursues a vision of a world where every single, single pregnancy is wanted. As we approach World Contraception Day this Sunday, there is no better time to shine the spotlight on women's access to health. It's interesting, isn't it? But more than 44% of the world's pregnancies are unplanned. Of these, more than half end in abortion. And we have the statistics that we add to this, the fact that there are 18 months into the global pandemic, and we're seeing millions of women lose their ability to plan for their families and protect their health. Clearly, we have a global dilemma, a dilemma that requires key thought leaders, shapers and enablers in women's health to really come together in these challenging times and also, importantly, to acknowledge the urgency to make sure that no woman is left behind, but also to look to the future at how innovation, technology and collaboration can also step up to bridge both new and existing uh, gaps in women's access to health. So we have three very exciting panels to bring you today. First up, it gives me pleasure to welcome Dr. Jamil Zamir, who's Director of Programs and Performance, East, South, East Asia and Oceania Region, Malaysia, for International Planned Parenthood Federation. Also, we welcome Mabub Alam, Family Planning Specialist, USAID, AUAFP, Bangladesh, for Pathfinder International. Next up, we also welcome Dr. Emi Nujarni, MPH President of the Indonesian Midwives Association. We're also delighted to have with us today Dr. Ratnabali Chakravorty, Vice Chairperson, uh, who's an obstetrician, gynaecologist, Calcutta, India, Chairperson of Advocacy Board Women's Health, IMS. And also delighted to have on the panel today Dr. Shivani Kapoor, who's Head of Medical Affairs, Pharmaceuticals Division, Asia Pacific, Bayer. It is wonderful to have each of you with us. And of course, it's great to have you with us. A wealth of knowledge in these five fantastic women's health champions. And I know also that we have a great depth of experience in our audience. And so you listening, wherever you may be joining us from, also play an important part in today's virtual forum. So please get your questions ready because we're going to open up for Q&A right after the um, sessions. We've also prepared some social media visuals so that you can collectively pledge and spread support for women amongst our fantastic networks in this World Contraception Day. Dr. Ratnabali, thank you once again for joining us. Of course, it's now um, 18 months um, in the region since we went into lockdown. <laughs> And it's estimated that 12 million women in this region have seen contraception interruptions. The result in India, for example, and I, I have the statistics here, is around 2 million unintended pregnancies, which are likely to lead to um, 1.45 million abortions. It's interesting to get your perspective on how significant are these particular numbers from where you stand. In our clinic, we found many people, probably during the first pandemic, uh, we did, could not arrange for uh, the online consultations. And uh, from the next uh, second wave of pandemic, we have started uh, uh, this uh, online consultations for this uh, contraception. As there was no access to the clinic, whether it's government or non-government, private clinics like ours, 
there were a lot of unintended pregnancies this is not only a burden to the family it's a burden to the society and with 137 crores of population in india thank you so much dr ratnabali now jamil is part of a global covid-19 task force with international planned parenthood federation are you seeing this first hand as well as a monumental public health issue that the region is really facing Yes, COVID nineteen has exposed terribly uh, reality of health systems, whether it is to do with financing, human resources. But let me talk a little bit about the supplies, which are very critical part, and we are seeing uh, a significant delays coming from other countries, particularly contraceptives and other reproductive health products. Uh, we saw SRH services being de- deprioritized. We saw overwhelmed health facilities. So, uh, from the IPPF uh, uh, perspective, as as a global uh, task force, the first global survey actually showed that about eleven percent of the total service delivery points were actually closed by end of April twenty twenty. So, it was around five thousand six hundred those SDPs. but then 90% of them actually resumed and reopened now mahbub uh, in many cities and towns where pathfinder international reaches we're seeing another wave of covid with the more deadly delta strain that's certainly been making headlines around the world but we're also starting to see some health services slowly return slowly resume what though in your mind remains the biggest concern as you have mentioned uh, during uh, covid during onset of covid we had no staff uh, in family planning service delivery but as the services are getting back so we need to concentrate or we need to help marginalized and and uh, migrant population to continue their family planning practices and in doing so we need to keep in mind that many of those population actually they start using contraceptives and later they get dropped out because of different reasons particularly due to side effects and uh, most of those side effects are minor and are associated with myths and misconception so we should have some intervention around those issues as well great so emi perhaps you can explain why midwives are so important to this discussion midwives are the people that the majority of women turn to for family planning services In Indonesia, 76.6% of contraceptives are delivered by midwife, and almost 56% of these contraceptive services come from a trust midwife or private midwifery clinics. These midwives are living within the same communities and easily accessible to women. They are grassroots health leaders. who are making a big difference to women in getting the right information to them Dr Shivani I'm interested to hear from you what we've seen from the data recently released is the need for modern methods of contraception which is largely unmet for more than 200 million women I think Tina the demand for modern contraception will continue to rise um especially as these populations continue to grow and our young women are more aware and they do not want to miss out on the benefits of voluntary family planning so we see that the use of contraceptives has not kept pace with the growth in the population and this really means that the number of women with unmet need for family planning continues to be projected to change little from 2015 on to 2030 a uh, who survey shows that around 68 to 70% of disruption happens in family planning and contraceptive services which could be around a duration of almost a, a three to four months 
Indeed. Thanks so much, Dr. Shivani. We're privileged now to hear from USEC One Antonio Perez III, MD, MPH, Executive Director, Executive Director from the Commission on Population and Development, or POPCOM, uh, which is the Philippines' lead organization in population management for well-planned and empowered Filipino families and indeed communities. It is notable too that the Philippines has the the second highest teen pregnancy rate in Southeast Asia. The pandemic, Popcom warns that we could see that figure rise 20%. Let's take a listen. Good day to everyone. Today we are in, our, in the 18th month of our pandemic, a global pandemic that has swept much of the world and has particularly affected countries like the Philippines. Over the last 18 months, has experienced four waves of the pandemic. And in each wave, about a third of the country has been affected. And with a third of the country affected, health services for the women of reproductive age have been reduced or have had to adapt to this pandemic. One third of our women have had to take difficult transportation means to get to health services. More recently, we have seen community pantries come forward and community pantries that are feeding the poorest communities of our uh, urban populations affected by the pandemic have included sexual reproductive health services because people consider this essential. Today, we have seen that 8 million women in the country who are actively using modern contraceptive methods. And this is partly because the most important problem women have said in the middle of the pandemic, their problem is unplanned pregnancies. Unplanned pregnancies ranging from teen pregnancies to pregnancies among the general population. Women today in the Philippines are also concerned about violence during the period of pandemic, emotional, physical, sexual violence. So these are top of mind of Filipino women. We believe this has led to more women seeking services in the middle of the pandemic. But despite this, we are noting an increase in teen pregnancies, particularly among those who are already head of families, meaning a repeat pregnancies among minors who are already pregnant might be, you know, another wave of uh, increasing pregnancies in this country. Today, while the pandemic continues to affect a large part of our population, we hope that our successes and our difficulties become learnings also for other countries in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much to Yusek Perez. Dr. Ratnabali, uh, back to you. What have you seen in your practice that's really worked to empower women in planning for their lives? There's information to the woman and counselling is the most important point uh, to empower the woman. Availability, accessibility definitely are. But the eye opener was in 2012, I was an investigator in international select study where a pre-counseling and post-counseling uh, was done in a woman coming to the clinic for contraception. And it was found that after giving the information and counseling, how the uptake rate increased and continuation rate of contraception increased. And it became very evident that counseling is number one point which we should stress upon so that the uh, contraception usage increases. And you can well imagine during uh, this pandemic uh, time when we uh, worked with a lesser number of our people in the clinic and the counselor not being available, then uh, what was the situation over there? So uptake rate drastically decreased. Uh, Jamil, you and your teams in some 25 countries have really been pounding the pavement in this pandemic door to door to reach the women who really just can't get to doctors and midwives, just like uh, Mabub's team that's, that we've just heard about. How have you 
seeing collaboration being really essential to making this possible, to making sustained and meaningful changes to the lives of women in underserved communities. COVID-19 has exposed terrible realities of health system. Uh, we saw uh, working with government a very critical uh, component of really reaching out to the most vulnerable and marginalized people. And I must uh, mention here that last month we have we have started a program uh, along with MSI, two years program reaching out to 21 countries to provide essential SRS services to the people affected by COVID. And we'll be adapting a very new approaches in terms of telemedicine, home delivery and self-care, including self-care managed uh, medical abortions. Uh, just to just to refer back to some of the uh, uh, estimates that we are going to reach out to 1.3 million unplanned pregnancies will be averted. 26.5 million SRS services will be delivered through this program. And Dr. Ratnabali, uh, I'm assuming it's not only working closely with government that's really important. It's uh, most definitely it's uh, very important. However, there is other uh, imperative in this topic. See, for example, if you only look at the gynecologists and obstetricians and the family planning providers uh, so that the government is working on them, it's not happening at all. Because the family physicians, other non-obs and gynae doctors, they must be informed properly. What happens, you know, Sometimes we prescribe a contraceptive, we explain to them, we counsel, they go back home and talk with their own family physicians. And they say, oh, no, you have got a breast tumor or fibrogenoma, and therefore you cannot use a, a contraceptive. Or you're a young girl, your age is only 18, you can't use a contraceptive. And uh, sort of things that have been discussed, which are absolutely not scientific. Therefore, providing information in some way or other uh, to these uh, doctors, non obscani and uh, as well as an obscani at every phase, not only in the suburban areas or urban areas, also to the rural areas is important. And who can do that? It's a great point you raised, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ratnabali, absolutely. Emmy, if I could just ask you, the wonderful thing about midwives is that they always have such a, 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 a terrific connection um, with the local women, with the communities, um, and they have such a great bond. Is that why you believe that they can make a real difference to women in those communities? What we are seeing that work very well is midwife empowering women pre and postpartum period, giving them important advice and options before a baby arrives, and then important contraceptive services after the baby has been arrived what we call the postpartum contraceptive. Access to contraception by opening up online consultation and also working with family planning officers to distribute contraceptions. We also utilize the online platform, what we call Click KB platform as a communication media between women and midwives to deliver information, education, and of course, counseling on family planning. Yes, and it's interesting too, Shivani, speaking about champions for women's health, how do you think innovators like <coughs> Bayer should add value to meeting these unmet needs? So I believe it's, it's about supporting uh, women and access to, to their modern contraceptive needs, just as we are doing it today. So for, for us in Bayer, we've set up a very ambitious sustainability goal where we aim to provide 100 million women in low and middle income countries with access to modern contraceptives by 2030. Um, and we aim to do this by funding multi-stakeholder aid programs and ensuring the supply of affordable modern contraceptives to these women. We're also working uh, to support the, the challenge initiative. Some of you might have heard about it. So it's, it's a program in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where the purpose is to empower city governments in Asia and Africa, line with our vision 
and to meet the needs of the society. Thank you. Now, um, last round of questions. The question is, what do you see as the most pressing need to change or to improve or continue doing in order to meet the biggest challenges around the corner in this COVID decade? Jamil, let's start with you. What I consider is, is the most uh, foremost uh, challenge is saving women's lives. And uh, here I'm talking about maternal mortality and morbidity due to lack of adequate maternal health services and due to unsafe abortion. In this, it's really important that we really go back and see how we are addressing three delays, particularly because of the COVID, the frontline workers are now disconnected. We have to reestablish with the community so that the first delay in deciding to seek appropriate care is taken uh, by the individual, the delay in reaching the health facilities and delay in getting the services in the health facilities. Dr. Emmy, We are uh, suggest uh, to improve the national health insurance coverage for family planning services and contraceptive, to improve such accessibility for women in Indonesia to all across the country. As an uh, Indonesian Midwife Association, in conducting the continuous professional development, through webinar, workshop, training, and other platform, how to improve midwives' competencies. Mabu, what about the imperative from your perspective? Uh, we need to support uh, hard to reach population of the lower middle income countries um, in avoiding their uh, unintended pregnancies. And the way we could do, we should provide uh, them support with uninterrupted supply of contraceptives. And the state and the private sectors should invest more so that uh, the contraceptive supply are uninterrupted and the family planning services are accessible to those hard to reach population. Dr. Shivani? Well, our key priorities are sustainability and access to health. And uh, we should not lose the very good momentum that has been built over the past decades with our partners. I believe for us, it's very, very important that all stakeholders come together. Uh, the government, the national, international partners, private sector, and, and we work together for a dedicated uh, effort to prioritize the sexual and reproductive health of women and girls in our region. Finally, Dr. Ragnabali. The summary of whatever I have talked to now, that is information and counselling uh, should be available to the woman as well as to the non-OBGY doctors and what else than a social media and digital platform is for. And the uh, government of India uh, has, uh, is, they have digitalized India and it's a flagship program of them. So it's not at all a problem. It's advancing every day and even in the remote corner of the rural India, digital platforms are available. If we uh, improve upon this social media and digital platforms and reach them, they will get more and more benefited by whatever facilities we have got in India today. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ratnabali, also to Jamil, Mahbub, Dr. Emmy, and Dr. Shivani. We're asking you now, what have you just heard from our panel that's really got you thinking about the solutions that are needed? In other words, what compelling information have you just heard that needs to be highlighted? We'd love you to now pen your comments and reflections into the chat box. And we want to know what's really resonated with you from the great information that you've just heard from our first panel and from the insights that you've heard from our expert speakers. So please share that with us as we prepare for our next panel. And already I can see that um, counselling, it seems, and going digital is likely to be just so important for women moving forward, given such a demand for contraception and reproductive health information. Um, so with the pandemic driving so many women online, the question is, how can we as experts meet them halfway to combat misinformation and connect them to the family planning and contraception resources that women so desperately need? It seems 
introduce, just now is the right time to introduce you to our next panel. So here's another poll for you on the big jump, if you like, in demand in Southeast Asia. Take a look at this. And with the pandemic driving many women online, how can we as experts meet that halfway to combat misinformation and connect them to the family planning and contraception resources that they so desperately need? It seems just the right time now to introduce you to our next panel as we step into her world engaging to empower women online. And I'm really pleased to introduce you to our next panel that we have with us. Firstly, Dr. Michelle Dado, who's an obstetrician, gynecologist, and digital thought leader, president of uh, Quezon City Medical Society District in the Philippines. We are also delighted to have with us Vivian Lim, co-founder, Women in Asia, and lead curator of TEDx Singapore. And Nicole Lim, founder of Something Private podcast from Singapore. And we welcome back Dr. Shivani Kapoor, Head of Medical Affairs, Pharmaceuticals Division, Asia Pacific from Bayer. Great to see you here once again, Shivani. Now, first question to Dr. Michelle. You would know that for many in this region, women really look to you to make informed decisions about their health, about their family planning, and even mental health. So the question is, how willing then are doctors to go online and provide medical care for women virtually? All right, here in the Philippines, not a lot of doctors are online talking about women's health and family planning. Um, I guess this is seen by the massive baby boom that's happening now in our country, um, wherein our population is estimated to um, increase by more than two, 2 million just because of the pandemic, okay? I think Filipino women have temporarily forgotten about family planning because of their preoccupation with COVID-19. So now more than ever, we need more digitally savvy doctors to talk about these things because we can see um, an increase in the number of Filipino women going online looking for answers to their questions. Then what needs to be done to break down these barriers to online conversations, online engagement for doctors? Educate. That's actually the most important thing, okay? Bayer here in the country has been the leader in medical training. They they continuously invite um, key doctors and they continuously host um, forums and lectures and webinars and seminars on um, family planning, on women's health. And they even actually held a series of lectures on training the trainers and teaching actually doctors to become more digitally savvy even before the pandemic. And which is actually one project that I personally um, adapted in my society, um, the Medical Society District 4, where I'm currently the president. Um, uh, I will be launching, or we will be launching actually a series of webinars of training the trainers to help more doctors um, become more actually comfortable to go online. Vivian, as founder of the Successful Women in Asia online community, you've seen the overwhelming number of women from all walks of life in this region who've turned to online platforms in this pandemic to get information. Uh, in fact, a comparison platform, interestingly, has just revealed that the search for contraceptives grew by 96% in the first trimester of this year compared to the same period um, back in 2019. I'm interested, what have you seen um, that's top of mind um, in health issues for women in this region in these really tough times? Um, the circumstances and problems faced by women um, in different parts of this region are very diverse. Uh, you know, to what Dr. Michelle has shared, um, those are circumstances that's very unique happening in the Philippines right now um, of what she shares with um, us earlier on women reaching online and um, trying to look at uh, health-related issues. Um, and even, you know, the data that you just shared, right, people searching for contraceptives. That's why, you know, uh, it's, it's very interesting we have to see, like, um, in this mix of culture, um, everyone looks at health issues differently. It looks at contraceptive, con uh, we even look at 
family planning issues um, very differently. So there's many voices in the online community and it can be really difficult sometimes to distinguish between fact, opinions, perspectives, you know, and, and really navigate this um, spectrum online. Interesting. So Michelle, what are some of the myths? What about the myths that exist about contraception um, online? And do you see any of those worrying trends? Okay, I can identify actually several things. First, a lot of people here in the country still think that there are more side effects than benefits um, with in terms of contraception. And in line with this, um, people think they are just limited to two to three choices or the, the two to three more popular ones. Okay, when in fact... Um, there are so many possible choices that they can, they can actually choose from. And um, because of this, they can actually, um, they will be able to identify what works best for them, what caters to their needs. And then another thing that I've noticed is there's a lot of information out there in the web, which uh, don't have a lot of scientific backup. Unfortunately, here in my country, there are more non-medical um influencers who are talking about health more than doctors and i'm not saying they are wrong i'm just saying we need to be guiding them these people have a lot of following and the people who follow them look at them as the experts or if we don't um, actually um, provide the right um, information then eventually this will be a problem for us in the future and lastly in my own practice i've noticed that um, even in my social media platforms Women ask for advice after getting all of these information online. And then when I finally give them the advice that they need, they would usually tell me that had they been given all the options and that had they been given an in-depth discussion of things, they would have made better choices regarding their health. Our next guest has made it his business to clear up local myths in Thailand, where he's committee member, Marketing Pharmacist Association of Thailand. He's Wirun Wetsuri, a practicing pharmacist in Thailand, and he engages the community he advises as a content creator. Wirun. Swadikrab. Currently, pharmacists in Thailand are rely on two main digital channels. First one is the pharmacist to pharmacist and pharmacist to patient. And you see from this picture, there are over 20,000 pharmacy outlets in Thailand and over 76%. It is pharmacy type 1 which requires pharmacists to operate. You can find most of the healthcare products in here, include antibiotics, contraceptive pills as one-stop service here. This channel is moving toward digital channel by O2O or online to offline and telepharmacy, which Pharmacy Council of Thailand are trying to endorse. About consumer behavior in Thailand, there are some misconceptions of contraception and women's health. For example, they still believe their friend and family more than other sources of information. Even the fact is wrong. So this is the weak point of the consumer and the pharmacist could correct this. During COVID-19, many teenagers think that sex is cheap and accessible pleasure. And they still believe that external ejaculation, watching the vagina, the counting date could prevent them from pregnancy. And also, it is the woman's responsibility to take care of pregnancy prevention. During this year, the pharmacists are trying to test new platform to engage with women online. For example, most of Generation Y community pharmacists, they tend to have Facebook page for their pharmacy outlet. And they start using new platform and many of pharmacists create content on TikTok and getting lots of views due to it's easy to digest short video. And they use live official account and Google My Business to make a call to action to bring their customer back to the outlet and make online to offline or all to all strategy. And finally, my suggestion is pharmacists should start working as a team and simplify the message and achieve tangible benefits. For working as a team, we should utilize pharmacies working group to make social listening and review up to date data. And if possible, two influencers impact more than one. So 
Cross Influencer is a very interesting project. You could bring two pharmacists or pharmacists with celebrity to create content. And to create more engagement, you must simplify the language, but must ready to answer in scientific reference and keep it relevant. Thank you very much. Sawadikrab. Thanks very much, Widon. Nicole, you are a successful content creator for Women Through Something Private podcast, which is really gaining traction. And uh, it's interesting to see so many people turning to your podcast for information. Um, take us through the complex world, if you like, of women's health through the eyes of your followers. Um, sexual education in this part of the world is quite lacking or it's still quite conservative. But I do see that um, working in this space, especially with the stuff that I do online, um, that the younger generation is actually really engaged in like social issues, gender identity, politics and sexual health. And it's also interesting because I think while we want to put out content that reaches this um, mass of audience, it's, it's also a bit of a fight for us because I think some of these platforms like um, Instagram, these content platforms, they do also um, have, we, we are privy to like their algorithm changes and sometimes it's it's difficult to reach our audiences because some of our content could be deemed a little bit uh, um, maybe sensitive for some younger audiences. What I do is I also look at gaps between women and try to find like credible information online and try to meet them halfway to bridge that gap so they won't end up looking at inaccurate information. Yes, certainly um, credibility, uh, responsible engagement is becoming an even bigger issue now with what you're saying. And so many women are taking advice on these serious issues of women's health and family planning online. Uh, Vivian, uh, let me ask you, from your experience, what is the best way to help women be directed to credible sources of information if we know that there is so much noise online and a lot of that is just opinion, not facts? One thing that we realised that makes a difference um, to women seeking uh, answers online is this power of sustained dialogue. So uh, a lot of times we realize that uh, not all topics can be solved uh, with just uh, social media posts alone or not all questions uh, can be answered through just one social media post. And what women um, are looking for uh, and what we can provide is this safe space um, for people, the right experts, uh, you know, the, the, the right women or men to come together to discuss these problems in order to work towards certain solutions um, or bring together like more doctors in, in a closed door setting um, and have the women share on ground experiences, um, you know, or even to, to, to talk about um, some of their myths, right, uh, and, and misconception um, when it comes to certain topics. So for my team, uh, when we publish information and dialogue, um, firstly, it is to go through our own round of discussion, right? Um, fact checks, uh, just like what Nico was saying, um, identify science back or evidence backs information. And if we decide that one particular theme or topic needs a longer dialogue, um, and it's something that we can never solve in um, uh, a short session or a 20-minute session, uh, we do not use that platform or channel. So uh, we actually would opt for you know having a, a closed or Zoom um, discussion um, to have this conversation, right, or things that are a bit more controversial or debate style, uh, and we ensure that the right people are in the room um, and sharing the right information. I, I love that you do that, and I just think that's so wise. Um, it's so much more than just one post. Absolutely true. Uh, Dr Shivani, as a women's healthcare leader, what role do uh, healthcare innovators <laughs> like Bayer play in this important online space? So um, just like Vivian mentioned, I think, um, you know, it's very important to provide that right information. And we worked hard over many decades uh, to be a trusted partner in this field where we work and enable the best and the brightest in our networks to come together uh, to serve the women and be uh, a partner to them and provide right information at the right time and on the right platforms. So even before the pandemic, if you know, uh, we've been very laser focused on supporting online activities with our major stakeholders to provide women and, and COVID really helped us expedite this, right? 
it, it's accelerated our efforts to carve out a very strong expert and credible voice online. So our online presence has been reinforced by the Your Life campaign and various websites. Uh, we have um, and chatbots in Malaysia, in Philippines, and in, in India, where social media partnerships with local doctors, influencers, and content creators has been our focus on different channels. For us, it's very, very important, Tina, that we have a vibrant, dynamic discussion, but with the urgency and the accuracy that is required so we are able to provide the right information for the women. Most women are really good at sharing. I mean, we are open to talk about difficult subjects by and large. And in a pandemic, we're, of course, hungry for information about mental health, about reproductive health, very, very important topics. Uh, what do you think that health experts, uh, Dr. Michelle, should uh, need to do better so that women can be better informed, particularly on these challenging times, on these challenging topics? The best thing that we can do now is actually look for the platforms where our, the, the women that we want to target are in. We have to find or identify the platforms where they are actually looking for answers. Example, Facebook, Instagram, um, YouTube, Twitter, uh, TikTok, or even Clubhouse in Singapore. And then when we actually find these platforms, we need to be in those platforms to be able to reach these women. And then we can actually start in-depth discussions like what Vivian um, talked about, or we can do fast talk discussions like what I usually do. And next, we actually have to create, create partnerships. This is very, very important. Um, what do I mean by this? We work with the people people who are already influencers. We work with companies who have the same um, goal as us, and that is educating and reaching more women and helping more women. I really agree with Dr. Michelle. I think collaboration is really key um, because, you know, with these community issues, I think getting various stakeholders involved is really great in um, getting a variety of experts and like opinions out to women who are kind of looking online and you know not really sure if this is like accurate or if this is is the right way to go about doing things and I so and so I think um that's that's really important on on my end as well and I think the bulk of what I do is um collaboration work with experts um in individuals who are like activists in the space so one example I think um which is is uh, something that we did recently on our platform is that um, there was a there was a bit of a public outcry on sexual assault that happened in Singapore sometime um, last year. And what we did was to invite a lawyer to come on board to share the perspective of you know how women can stay protected in the event that they get harassed online. So um, it's interesting because I think a lot of girls were were asking us how do I stay protected? You know how do I report um, an incident that happened to me and the best way was obviously to get somebody who had knowledge in this area to kind of tell them what were the steps and like the accurate procedures to go about doing it. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Shivani, can I ask you, are you seeing a greater uptake of organisations really willing to come on board with market leaders in women's health like Bayer to create partnerships to be more vocal champions of women's health and family planning? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've always welcomed more collaboration. Collaboration and innovation are really the heart of how we have always been molding ourselves for a better future for women's healthcare. And, and given this huge and urgent unmet need as already highlighted by the first panel, we've always been very keen to work with our stakeholders and who are enthusiastic to partner with us. Take for example, Tina, um, our global Your Life campaign for 15 years, we've been working closely with 16 partners in, on World Contraception Day Coalition to maintain a very dedicated resource where we try to provide accurate, easy to digest and unbiased information on both modern contraception and sexual health for the young ladies. And I think these are resources which um, Vivian and Nicole have all, also alluded to earlier, how they help us and they equipped key stakeholders with useful teaching resources 
So we are able to extensively engage the young women um, and, you know, our networks work with them. So, so I think it's, it's very important for us uh, in Bayer as well. Let's hear from Dr. Yung Che Tsai, who is Director of OBGYN Department at Chi Mei Medical Centre and Convener, Female Adolescent Healthcare Group, Taiwan Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology, or TAOG, as he shares how his organisation actually champions women's health in their online activities and their partnerships in Taiwan. Before we started, I want to, I would like to introduce the TAOG briefly. TAOG was founded in 1966 with more than 2,600 members so far. TAOG is the largest medical society of OB and GYN doctors in Taiwan. And I, I am the head of OB and GYN department in Chime Medical Center in Taiwan. And the reason why I'm here is because I have been I have been the commander of Female Adolescent Healthcare Group of TALG since 2012. Birth control is a challenge issue among adolescents because we still have students with an intended pregnancy among 4,000 persons per year. We have a mama under 20 years of age get pregnant about 2,300 per year. The TALG had made a lot of effort in contraception knowledge promotion uh, for the past few years. Uh, we found when the adolescents have a, a contraception question, they get their contraception knowledge from the school nurses, followed by the social media such as internet, PR media, social, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Line, and others. The position of TLG in contraception education is that we provide the online and offline platform to connect healthcare professionals and the young generation in contraception education. For example, we train the Goodwill Ambassador and go deep, go deeply into the uh, campus. Uh, basically, this ambassador is, um, is formed by the OB and GYN doctors. And we, we told this doctor we have the, an ethical obligation to provide the best possible contraception method for our adolescent patients. And what we want this doctor to deliver contraceptive method and the sexual health lectures into campus and provide counseling by telephone, hotline and question on official website. In, 20, in 2013, it's the first time we established the official website, which is named 8181. It's a, we provide the contraception guidance for adolescents. And in 2015, we recruit our doctor and we start a campus to our contraception education. And um, it's good. We reach over 2000 students attend this, camp uh, this tour per year. And um, since 2000, 2020, because of the outbreak of the COVID-19, uh, this campus tour education has changed into online courses. And in 2017, we published the education brochure for everyone. And in 2018, we have established a Facebook called Miscontraception, and we have a fan follow our Facebook around 15,000. And in 2019, we published a series of micro movie of contraception performed by the healthcare professional, including doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and, and the effect is also very good. And then in 2020, we recruit a contraceptive ambassador to drive awareness about adolescent. So this is the, what we did in, in the past few years and uh, the results come out very good. As we can see in the extended pregnancy in the past few, the number is decreasing. Thank you so very much, Dr. Tsai. Finally, let's conclude with a very short but snappy perspective from each of you. As leaders in your field online, we want to ask you, how do we better engage and what do we need to be discussing right now? What do we need to be discussing with women online so that they are best equipped to take control of their health and their life? Nicole, let's begin with you. 
So for me as a content creator, I think it's important to find ways to write on the wave of family planning issues when our audience is interested. And I think more importantly, when they are not interested in these issues, right? Because I think that with um, all that's going on in the world, our attention span can be quite short. You know, we feed from like one issue to another. And sometimes we, we are interested in like women's health issues, but um, when something more major happens in the world, we kind of like put it at the back and we, we forget about it a bit. And you, Vivian? I feel we need to put the topic of gender roles uh, back on the table. Um, throughout this whole pandemic, we've been hearing how um, you know, women are facing um, different stresses uh, at home, um, handling work, uh, and the uneven um, distribution and responsibility of um, even you know, child caring at home. So I feel that you know, in our community, um, we need to continue and um, like what Nicole say, right on this wave, um, now that we saw all these issues and problems when it comes to family planning or family support, um, let's take this opportunity uh, to reevaluate um, gender roles um, in homes and workplaces um, in the family structure um, and discuss about them together. Dr. Shivani, what's important about the way we engage audiences in women's health? So one is really to find out timely what are the hot topic opportunities such as World Contraception Day and how we can maximize the outreach in a timely fashion. The second one is also about collaboration. So we are able to provide, uh, co-create a timely and relevant content and empower credible expert voices like we have today in the panel to engage women online. So correct information is out there, both during the peak and off peak hours or times and with the right volume and very accurate content and it reaches the right audience the right women so they're able to make those tangible decisions which impact to transform their lives and michelle okay what i think should be on top of the agenda right now is actually creating innovative ways to help equip the doctors to be able to fully engage with the people online. During this pandemic, we are in the front line in the hospitals treating patients, but we can also be in the front line of social media and reach more people, actually reach more women and help more women. We need to actually make that effort and be in the front line of social media because there is no better person to talk about healthcare than us doctors. Absolutely. Well said. What innovative ideas can I ask you listening from all around the region? What innovative ideas and solutions did you find the most enlightening from our second panel? Was there perhaps a light bulb moment for you in listening to any of uh, our panellists just now? Or maybe, just maybe, you have some creative ideas of your own to help break the cycle of misinformation that we've been hearing so much about in the last few minutes. A reminder too that in about 20 minutes will be your opportunity for Q&A, so please get your questions ready. But before then, a really exciting look at the future. I want you to take a look at the poll and make your best guess how many in Asia are ready for digital health. Take a look at this. And with the wide spectrum of women in our diverse region, how can digital technology and advancements really successfully expand access to healthcare and family planning solutions to each and every woman? I now have great pleasure in welcoming our next panel of creators and innovators. Let me introduce you to Jack Shen Lim, who's Honorary Treasurer and Chairman of Health Technologies, Devices and Innovation Chapter, Malaysian Pharmacist Society. Jocelyn Newcomb, Senior Vice President of Public Health at M Clinica. Great to have you here, Jocelyn. We're also delighted to have Ethel Tan, co-founder, Ordinary Folk, Noah and Zoe, Singapore. And Edward Booty, founder and CEO, Reach 52, Accessible Healthcare Startup. Also today, Dr. Raymond Choi, co-founder and CEO of Doc2Us in Malaysia. 
And it's great to have once again, Dr. Shivani Kapoor, Head of Medical Affairs Pharmaceuticals Division, Asia Pacific, Bayer. So, okay, our next panel, let's jump straight in. And Jack, why don't you give us a bit of a quick snapshot of the good and the not so good news about our region on this particular topic? Well, let's start with the not so good news. Um, this region, um, Southeast Asia, we have the highest, one of the highest unmet needs for contraception and one of the lowest prevalences, um, contraception prevalence rates globally. The good news, we are one of the fastest growing regions in the world with regards to the economy, the development, and when it comes to digital growth and the online usage, we are leading the world. The digital platform is probably the one driving force that can bring the three most important things with regards to healthcare and family planning, which is education, access to information and contraceptives, and privacy. Jocelyn, if I can ask you, you see pharmacies as a critical first line for women and girls. And so you created Swipe RX, which is a, a wonderful innovation. What is that doing that could not be achieved just before your innovation? That's right. We know that pharmacies are frontline providers of contraception and related reproductive health services for women and girls because of their convenient opening hours and easy access. And the problem that we're solving with SwiperX, a multifunctional pharmacy focused application, is enabling global health partners to reach thousands of mom and pop retail pharmacies with speed and scale that has not been previously possible. Through SwiperX, we have created a professional network of more than 200,000 pharmacy professionals across Southeast Asia. And through this network, we are enabling global health partners to educate pharmacies about contraceptive methods, specific side effects, benefits, contraindications, and client-centered counseling at scale for the first time. Ethel, in Singapore, you created, very interestingly, a, a femtech platform that treats not just fertility, but also sexual health as well. How is this different from, say, telehealth and what unmet need does this serve currently that perhaps hasn't been done before? We all know that you know, Singapore is a modernized country, but we still live in a very conservative society. There are still six months when it comes to talking about sexual health. Like in Singapore, when one says the word sex, you're just like, you know, right? And honestly, it's because of such reactions that, that women in Singapore feel very afraid. They're afraid of being judged. So what we do at Zoe is to provide an access upfront where every single step of the way, once they step onto our platform, there will be information to help guide them to make informed decisions, even before seeing the doctor. So really pre-consultation, during the consultation, and even post-consultation. And we know that contraception can be time critical, and we do um, deliver our contraception between two to four hours. What about the 60% of women in our region who are actually not connected to the internet, not connected to digital? What does Reach 52 do about that? 52% uh, of the world cannot access healthcare, right? So that's why we're called Reach 52, really about reaching people that can't access healthcare. So yeah, what we're doing is we're going to more rural areas. Uh, we train one or two people in that village, very often the community health worker, and then using a tech platform we've built, they collect data on healthcare needs firstly, then run very targeted uh, public health events or public health campaigns and order and distribute private sector products. And yeah, as, as you rightly say, 60% of people in our communities do not have access to the internet. It's growing fast, but there's still offline communities. And that's where we feel this network of women to support that online to offline bridge is absolutely essential. Dr. Raymond, uh, in a significant step, uh, Malaysia got its very first telepharmacy dedicated to family planning on the Doc to Us platform last month, which was really interesting. As co-founder of that, uh, in a struggling COVID country like Malaysia, could you tell us what benefits will this bring to women there? I think it's an introduction of te first telepharmacy solution in Malaysia. Um, now women will be able to actually, you know, see the, the, the pharmacies online and then they can get actually the contraceptive pills online and all the way delivered to the doorstep. And this solution is the first in Malaysia and we are happy that to, to actually working with a Bayer to provide this uh, similar solution from end to end to empower women to actually, you know, inquire 
uh, more about family planning, contraception, as well as uh, having their contraceptive pills delivered all the way to the doorstep. And with Doc to us right now, uh, actually, you know, we are the uh, telehealth uh, solution provider based in Malaysia, and we are able to generate uh, e-prescriptions, online consultation services uh, for the patients as well, uh, not only involving doctors, but also pharmacies. And this is what we talk about, the online to offline or the hybrid care model that we are actually providing in Malaysia right now. Dr. Shivani, these innovations are clearly making their mark uh, throughout the region, but as a leader in healthcare, um, how do you think such innovations have helped women gain access to health and medicines fast despite the COVID crisis? So Tina, digital information has a huge potential to accelerate how soon we can deliver innovation and improve the health for our women. For example, with the, with the pandemic in, in Malaysia, there has been a 50% drop in the number of patients per month, either because they're not able to travel or due to financial barriers, which has led to an increase in the frequency of unplanned pregnancies. We partnered with two major local pharmacies and a telehealth partner to launch the first telepharmacy dedicated to family planning. I would like to share with you another example where you know, women's reproductive health chatbot in Philippines has been now upgraded to Asmara 2.0. And with this, women are turning online to access the health services as the pandemic restrictions have tightened. And this chatbot has now expanded to provide information, teleconsultation, and also be able to locate local pharmacies nearby and get more information on expanded services such as endometriosis. You know, innovations are also making quite an impact on South Asia. In a United Nations report back in March earlier this year, it shared that the pandemic may have indirectly contributed to 3.5 million unplanned pregnancies in South Asia. We'd like to hear now from Dr. Manakshi Ahuja, who is Director and Senior Consultant, OBGYN, at Fortis La Femme, New Delhi, India, on how telehealth and digital innovation in healthcare is really making a difference in her practice and, importantly, in the patients that she sees. Frankly speaking, telemedicine had never taken off before the COVID pandemic in India because uh, telemedicine was actually not recognised by the government. Our consultations were basically only one-on-one -on -one as physical consults. Things have completely changed after the COVID pandemic, where doctors were not accessible to patients and patients did not want to leave the safety and comfort of their, of their homes. And they were definitely not interested in coming to the hospital, where their fear of catching more COVID was there. Also, all of us were also advising patients not to step out of home unless actually necessary. And that's when the platform of telemedicine really took off and boomed in the country. Frankly speaking, in a country like India and a city like Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, I guess, Bangalore, where traffic jams are a big problem and you spend as much time commuting for that 15 minutes or 20 minute uh, doctor visit, I think telemedicine is actually the way to go. Probably... Um, 60 to 70 percent of my consultations I would be doing on the telemedicine platform. Uh, definitely for women's health and contraception is where it goes. These are places where you don't necessarily need to examine a patient personally. Sometimes a patient may want a consultation with her partner or husband with us and that becomes comfortable on a telemedicine platform because even till date in India we are avoiding having the attendant in the chamber when we are doing a consult. So frankly, when you need more than one person, because sometimes contraceptive advice is something which works for both the partners or they want to listen in. So it works beautifully. And also now in metro cities with more and more working women, where their hours clashing with the doctor and again, the same uh, problem about the traffic and the roads, definitely more women reach out for contraceptive advice because it's easier for them to access their doctor even during our office hours. 
by taking a 15 minute break here i would say more women seek advice for contraception and family planning and their women's health on an online platform than they would in physical sense because there are other logistics to be considered especially in the case of working women you know one thing that is very clear is that you've all been so successful for your outstanding ideas and also your skillful multi-stakeholder collaborations and i think that's really shining through in each and every one of your great innovations so jocelyn let me ask you what was the critical success factor in that regard at m clinica strong partnerships with pharmacy associations and the Ministry of Health have enabled SwiperX to become the largest digital education provider across Southeast Asia. In partnership with pharmacy associations, we are now offering accredited webinars and modules, which enable pharmacy professionals to upgrade their knowledge free of charge from the safety and convenience of their pharmacy or home. This has been a game changer in pandemic times and it's also been the first time that ministries of health have been able to educate pharmacy professionals about contraceptive choice and other aspects of women's health at scale. Edward? Government partnerships are absolutely essential and we have to consider this market by market basically, so a tailored uh, structure or approach depending on the country that you operate in. Uh, I think the key for us at least in being, you know, working with government has just been transparency up front. We're looking to connect stakeholders who are not already connected and really build, you know, health for all through both public and private sector. And I think, you know, when we're looking at our model, training the agents on the ground, it really just comes down to supply chain. We go to rural areas. We work with government, with private sector, and both of them, you know, use us as a channel for collectively strong, co you know, comprehensive healthcare in very, very hard to reach areas. Absolutely. And, and uh, we're hearing about that loud and clearly, aren't we too, Edward? So yes, thank you for that. Polls up, everyone. Okay, so take a guess now at how fast telehealth in women's healthcare is really growing in Asia. And as co-founder of one of the pioneering femtech startups in Singapore, where agility and where stakeholder engagement is just critical, can I ask you, Ethel, what have you learned and what advice could you offer to other health startups? For us, what we found highly effective is really to leverage on the many different digital platforms that are out there. So, um, you know, for us, we engage with social media platforms like, you know, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, where we really use like memes and GIFs, which are very relatable. We also have content articles that are really straight to the point and backed by experts. Besides that, we also have partnerships that is actually very vital for this change to occur. We work with one of the best uh, OBGYNs in Singapore. But of course, you know, with digital comes a challenge, right? Are we real? Are we legitimate? And, you know, working with renowned OBGYNs and other licensed professionals really help ease out patients. And from there, we've actually seen results from this. We have had over a thousand patients on our platform within six months. And we've also seen a rise in the number of women coming onto our platform to get contraception for the first time. That's great. Uh, Jack, what sort of innovations do you believe are needed in the pharmacy space uh, looking to the future? Uh, number one is we need to improve collaboration between health professionals, uh, doctors and pharmacists. What is new is that we need to bring them to work together on digital platforms because this will increase the reach. Secondly, this is the one for the regulators actually, uh, is to employ new technologies uh, such as IoT to improve our ability to track and trace. Um, this issue of concern there is that when we um, send something out um, on delivery via a digital platform, it's whether the medication actually reached the intended person. And uh, using this technology for track and trace, we can address that. And finally, lastly, we need to be patient-centered. Um, Pharmacists, um, I have to be the first to admit, tend to be product orientated and doctors tend to treat diseases rather than people. So um, one of those innovations that we need to look at is how to improve user experience. But ultimately, we need to get um, the patient journey right so that the patient can reach their goals in family planning and fulfill their needs.
What do you believe, Raymond, is the next wave of digital innovation that needs to happen in telemedicine and digital health to really empower women, especially in family planning matters? It's really about how can we make, you know, healthcare delivery uh, more accessible, safer, you know, uh, cheaper and also surer. I think we can break it down into uh, four areas. We call it the A, B, C, D, right? So A, we're talking about artificial intelligence, right? So and I think it's really about how we actually leverage on, on AI and make us, you know, uh, uh, smarter, better and more efficient, right? In terms of, uh, you know, medical and healthcare delivery services. B, we're talking about blockchain technology, right? So how can we actually provide a more secure, a more authorized, you know, data, you know, a management and storing system uh, to the patient, to the healthcare providers and the uh, ecosystem. And so, so we're talking about the blockchain technology. C is a cloud computing. So how can we actually provide this, you know, uh, cloud computing system so that, you know, wherever you are, you are able to access to a health record. You are able to access to the healthcare services or, or knowledge or information. And last but not least, we are talking about data analytics, the D, right? And data analytics is so important because right now we are, you know, collecting and generating a lot of data. For instance, in talk to us every day, we are, we are generating thousands of e-prescriptions and every one minute we're generating one e-prescription. Thanks so much, Raymond. Um, finally, let's take you all, if you like, to the next frontier. You are on this panel, the wonderful creators, the brains, the thought leaders, the, the energy that really will empower women to take control of their health, to take control of their family planning. Now, we know that outbreaks like this might happen again and therefore critical resources and systems really need to be in place to promote sexual and reproductive health. So if you had the resources, the partnerships to take digital health uh, for women in this COVID decade to the next level, what would that look like? What specifically are you working on, Shivani? These wonderful panellists give me every reason to be optimistic about the future of women's health. Collaboration and innovation drive our exciting upcoming plans for women's health and we look at existing areas of unmet needs and we take action now to meet these needs with our pipeline and our, and our strong research. Take for example, there's a high unmet need for women who suffer from vasomotor symptoms such as hot flashes when they're closer to their menopause and we see this in about 80% of the women. And today we are working on non-hormonal therapies to ease the symptoms of these women. Today, we offer a wide range of birth control measures for, for women, along with menopause therapies and other gynecological conditions to meet their needs across all age groups. And tomorrow and for the future, there are a number of innovations in our pipeline and our research effort is really focused on new treatment options for disease, uh, these conditions with high unmet need. Great. Raymond? I think if I had the resources, uh, what I would like to do for the women would be to, to further you know, improve our current you know, technology and digital platforms to further empower the women to take care and take charge of their health and not only talking about women's health, but as a health uh, as a whole, right? And how can we actually, you know, empower them and educate, you know, for instance, pregnant ladies, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do they take care of themselves during the whole pregnancy uh, via technology, via connectivity, and, and also via IoT devices so that, you know, they might have a less visit to the obstetrician and, you know, have, a, you know, more, more, more time to be spent, you know, at home, and, you know, so really it's about providing a smarter solution, a smart home solution for our women, uh, not only when they're pregnant, but also, you know, when they're outside the pregnancy, how can we, we be the on, the on the spot for them at the right time, at the right place, you know, via technology and, and you know, digital healthcare solution. Jocelyn, what's in your exciting pipeline? At M Clinica, we're excited about leveraging our technology to strengthen and improve the efficiency of the contraceptive supply chain at the pharmacy. We know that pharmacies spend a lot of time sourcing contraceptives and other supplies. And in two markets in Southeast Asia, Thailand and Indonesia, we're already using our technology to make it easier for pharmacies to source 
quality products at the right price. And we're excited about the potential to expand this technology throughout Southeast Asia. More contraceptive choice at the pharmacy translates into improved health outcomes for women and girls. And Ethel? Women are challenging the norms and are speaking up on issues that were once shoved under the carpet. I mean, this increase in awareness, early self-detection and better management of illnesses by women has led to an increase in demand for technological solutions. However, this demand has not been fully satisfied yet. So here at Zoe, what we want to do is we want to play a part in satisfying this demand. And what we want to do is really leverage on technology to provide insights on our bodies and to allow women to make more informed decisions where they have the control to plan ahead in life. Thanks, Ethel. Uh, Edward, I'm really interested to hear from you. What's around the corner from REACH 52? But what we're working on right now is some pretty exciting innovations around personalization. So yeah, we do look to understand our users up front. We do have data. And now we're really about personalizing content, the engagement we push out and the experience, you know, the right time in the right place in the right format with the right messages based on, you know, that individual as a person. And I think one of our biggest learnings that's sort of driven that is just because you're poor or poorer uh, doesn't mean you want a poor experience. So for us now, it's really about that personalization and, and you know, contextualization of what we do uh, to really achieve health for all, especially in more rural, poor areas. Absolutely. And I love that line, just because you're poor, you're not expecting poor service. Um, how important is that, Edward? Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so very much. And I can't imagine a better note to end on what inspiring innovations we are looking to in the future. A very, very special thank you to each of you on our panel. We wish you continued success. So we wanted to make the very most of this great opportunity, having brought together so many important stakeholders from governments, NGOs, from startups, influencers, media and healthcare professionals on this important forum. Each of our panellists and each of our guest speakers are committed to this topic. And here is a great opportunity to make a change or to take real action. So inspired by this collaboration, we have created what we're calling a United Pledge. And we hope that everyone here can join us to commit to this pledge as well, to be the change that we really need to see. Let's take a look now at the pledges already made by our panellists today, all of them enthusiastically agreeing to take control in their own way, as we together help to really shape digital health for women in this COVID decade. For those of you in the audience, I encourage you to also join us in making this very important pledge via the live poll. A reminder too that we will be sharing social media captions and visuals for you to share them on your social media channels. We'd love that. So please let's create a chorus of support for women and use this great opportunity to get even more people on board thinking and importantly taking action on improving women's access to healthcare and family planning throughout our region. You know, I really look forward to making all of us make good on these pledges so that women right across the region can be supported, whether online or face to face, to make really informed choices about looking after their health, planning their lives and planning their families. I'm sure so many of you right now are ready with your questions. Please be sure that before you input your question into the text box, let us know who the question's for. And the first one has just come through for Juan Antonio uh, Perez. In your perspective, can we please ask you, Yusek Juan Antonio Perez, what is the biggest barrier, your biggest concern about women's access to contraception in the Philippines. Yes, uh, Tina, uh, the, the biggest barrier today uh, remains uh, the COVID, uh, the, the, the fear of uh, 
uh, reaching out uh, uh, to uh, healthcare providers because uh, up to a third or more of Arctic continues to be in some form of lockdown. So uh, bo- the, the, there is a great uh, a greater demand for family planning, but uh, the barrier that COVID has created has also created, uh, you know, um, um, difficulty in accessing healthcare providers. They have to come. They have to get a schedule. They have to in uh, in the public health uh, system. And in Mindanao, they complain that really family planning is difficult difficult to access. But for two-thirds of the country where there is uh, less impact of COVID, uh, it is a bit more normal. Um, um, One difficulty that we are facing now uh, that would uh, in the future be, um, you know, uh, would uh, lead to uh, difficulty for us is that the long the permanent methods of family planning, uh, vasectomy, tubal ligation, which is the demand of a good number of women uh, mm. and men, uh, is not available uh, generally in most provinces. Mm-hmm. So you do not have the complete menu of family planning services, yes. uh, particularly yes. for the permanent methods. But the commodities... Uh, the natural family planning methods are generally available. Thank you, Tina. Thank you very much. Uh, we're on, with Siri, we've got a question for you. Someone wrote in, what is the one digital or medical innovation that you hope to see in the future that you believe will really benefit your female patients in Thailand? I think a digital platform will be more easier to access uh, in the future. Even maybe in these few years, uh, we may have uh, uh, one telepharmacy application service for each pharmacy outlet, just like uh, social media that now every outlet have. So there are lots of possibility about digital platform to support healthcare professionals, uh, and there will be a lot of choice. However, I think the tool to support community formation for SCP healthcare professional and transform them into tangible benefits. As uh, I mentioned in my presentation, uh, to make a sustainable healthcare service in the future. Thank you for Mm -hmm. having me. Excellent, excellent. We just had a question come through for Dr. Raymond Choi. What are some cutting edge technology or innovations that you're working to implement or have seen in telehealth, for example, drones or artificial intelligence? Yes, thanks Tina. I think, I think that the future is, is very bright and we are very positive about you know the, the, the future in terms of the technology uh, in terms of the medication delivery uh, and so we're looking at you know drone technology uh, delivering medication uh, medical supply as well as you know equipments to the you know isolated places and and so on and so forth as well as you know I think the future relies on you know uh, bringing care to home. Uh, and, and also, I think we will probably see, you know, more vending machines, right, dispensing uh, medications and oral contraceptive pills in, in, in residential areas, in commercial areas. So I think the future really, uh, uh, you know, is something that we, we are very, you know, uh, uh, positive about and looking into artificial intelligence, you know, data analytics and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Gives us reason for hope. Thanks so very much. Uh, Dr. Ratnabali, uh, a question for you has just come through. It says, could you share more about what contraceptive counselling is and how you've seen it benefit or help women in taking care of their health and family planning? So as I discussed earlier also, that when we do the select study, we found that uh, a pre-counselling and a post-counselling, when we measured the uptick of any sort of contraceptive was much, much bigger. So uh, we should take about two points uh, into our mind that this discussion should be client-centric, not the physician-centric. Many a times we start with a point that uh, if you <laughs> use this, you will, uh, be, uh, you will not become pregnant and also uh, maybe you will not have this one, two, three, four, which doesn't make any sense to the patient, to the woman. But if it is a client-centric, mm. that for example, if you ask what is your problem, what sort of contraceptive you use, you know, in a rural setup also, if somebody wants to dispose of the condom, there is not, that becomes a problem. 
if somebody wants to keep an ocp somewhere that is not at all a private so you have to talk with the patient what is actually the need what is the problem and then prescribe the uptake and continuation rate which is more important uptake may be seen uh, at the moment is very 100% but uh, the continuation rate drops down so that will be good and second point uh, which i really like to highlight that uh, the conversation what we have to do the communication should be task mediated task oriented so uh, instead of telling you take a uh, oc pill 21 days every month and give a gap of 7 days if you really say that this is a medicine <laughs> you are a healthy young individual and uh, you are going to prevent your pregnancy and get a lot of other benefits and uh, this is how it works and it is efficacious so you tell in a very absolute numbers not in percentage the failure rate if you talk about the side effects individually and the risks and then also you have to uh, you know sort of anticipate and address what are uh, you know the their uh, barrier to the correct use of the contraceptives and mm-hmm. also uh, you can uh, talk about uh, that uh, uh, if uh, there is any misconception in the woman you have to you know that disintegrate that you have to discuss and misconception to take out the woman won't tell you but once you start discussing she will tell i am very afraid of breast cancer so you have to give absolute numbers say for example there are 100000 women if uses there will be 25 cases if not using it 25 cases and if they use it there will be 30 cases so you mm-hmm. just find out if there are 100000 women in your locality so then yeah. it strikes in her mind that okay i have only say 100 women in my locality my friends so the percentage the total absolute number of cases of breast cancer will drop down to this so mm-hmm. things like that you have to give time and you have to develop this mode how you would like to talk beforehand so that when you are just confronting each and every side effect each and every risk and the good effects and for example with oc's non contraceptive benefits so you yeah. have to do them properly and then discuss them and it should be client centric a problem oriented discussion which will give the best result Mm-hmm. And thank you so much. Coming from uh, such a wealth of experience, Dr. Ratnabali, really appreciate that. Uh, we have a question that's just come in right now for Dr. Yung Chie Tsai. Uh, TAOG has a very rich social media channels to provide all kinds of contraceptive information. They've asked, "What's your next step to prevent unintended pregnancies for disadvantaged groups like teenagers?" Can we just ask you to unmute please? Okay. It's a fortune. Thank you Tina for your question. I'm sorry for for the, for the microphone. It's a fortune that we did not have so severe pandemic outbreak of COVID-19 in Taiwan during 2020 to 2021. Our people still have all access to medical services and uh, the contraceptive material were not short of during this period. Despite we have established online courses and the social media to promote the correct knowledge of contraception, still we have 4,000 students get pregnant and 2,300 teenagers younger than 20 years old get pregnant per year. So how to identify those teenagers who are prone to get pregnant unintentionally become very important to us. Our next plan is to visit those places such as Second Chance Home for Teen Moms, or me wait house for teenager and her kids we hope through their help we can find more teenager who might get pregnant in the near future in advance and to provide this teenager with the right knowledge to prevent the uh, intended pregnancy thank you Mm-mm. Thank you, Dr. Yong. Um, Ethel Tan, a question that's come through for you. Do you experience any cultural or social barriers uh, with issues in regards to adoption of telehealth when reaching out to modern women in the community? So, what we experienced was actually more of like a social barrier when it came to adoption of telehealth. So, you know. Um, I feel like women in Singapore are generally actually open to telehealth, but of course, when they st- when they first start on it um there were some bunch of questions that were asked arising from personal concerns and actually this proves that there are stigmas that exist 
um, and this is what makes women hesitant from adopting telehealth in the first place. So some common concerns were about like, how discreet are your packaging? Is it possible for you guys to leave the parcel somewhere else, do not ring the doorbell? And I think the reason for these concerns are due to the fact that, you know, for us, we are always living with our parents, right? So there's like sometimes even grandparents. So first generation, two generations, three generations in a household. And, and I think um, we, you know, this is like a societal norm in Singapore. And because of this stigma and judgment and us living in a very conservative culture, women are afraid of being judged. I'm really happy that we managed to identify um, these barriers and we work around them so women in Singapore get access to contraception a lot easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Jamil Zamir, you mentioned three uh, key delays that we need to address. I'm interested to hear from you an example of what we can do to address the most pressing of those delays, especially getting information to women. So, um, so it's, it's really important uh, that we first reconnect our frontline workers with, with women, particularly poor and uh, vulnerable women. Uh, both through the online channels, wherever it is possible, and also through uh, physical uh, contacts. And that will really help us to uh, provide uh, required essential critical information to, for women to really access uh, services. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Uh, Mabub Alam, a question's come through and they've asked, from your experience in Pathfinder, what type of collaborations or partnerships do you hope to see more of in the future? Well, uh, so far we have been very successful uh, in ensuring uh, collaboration with uh, government stakeholders. In fact, uh, most of our uh, support uh, goes to the uh, government. But now we are th- uh, thinking that we need to take uh, private sectors on board as well uh, to ensure better coordination, to ensure uh, contraceptive accessibility, particularly for the marginalized population. And as I have informed earlier, Pathfinder mostly work in the uh, lower middle income countries where we have found that private sector's involvement is not at the expected level. We have much more to do on this. Mm -mm. Thank you, Mabu. Um, A question's now come through for Dr. Dado uh, from an attendee who says, should contraception use be restricted to only women? Is it safer and more organic for the husband to use contraception as well? Your response. All right. Presently, there are more than um, 10 choices for women and two choices for men only, namely condom and vasectomy, and and both are um, non-hormonal. Anyway, with more choices for women, the situation is better. However, it's very unjust because majority of the contraceptive responsibility still falls on the woman when, in fact, we should actually already be moving towards shared contraceptive responsibilities. So I think it's very important that we should now work on developing more um, contraceptive methods for uh, men as well. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. We're going to extend the Q&A time just for a couple of minutes, uh, a little bit longer. And we've got a really important question for Yusek Perez um, from an attendee. And this question is about, do you see a world where contraception is available for all for free? Can I just please get you to put your microphone on, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Tina, for the question and uh, the, the, uh, the one who asked. Uh, countries like the Philippines uh, have committed to provide universal access to sexual reproductive health uh, services uh, you know, universally. Um, and then uh, that was a decade ago. Uh, More recently, we have adopted uh, a law on universal health. Now, that sometimes uh, can bring on problems. Uh, The government is committed to provide access for all. However, when you uh, have universal health care, which is provided by both public and private uh, sectors, there are big problems in running the whole system. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, we may have to commit to continuing a national program uh, within a universal healthcare system. So we need to reconcile that. And we do know that uh, universal healthcare, uh, if it includes family planning, contraceptives, can really reduce the cost uh, at point of care. So it would be important to find a way to combine uh, programs on, on family planning with the universal health care. Yes. Number of countries that are going into universal health care. Thank you. Tina. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Ethel, quick question. Um, how to track on a personal level that women who start off with contraception do not drop off the radar halfway? So for us at Zoe, we do have um, a concept team. So what we do is we will always check in with uh, our patients. Um, we'll we'll always check in to see how things are like for them, and if they ever need to do a follow up with the doctors, we'll always book them in. So you know, having this personal touch um, will definitely help in educating them as well, and so that they know um, they they will get the knowledge of uh, more about contraception. Mm -hmm. Dr. Raymond, do you have anything to add to that about making sure that women don't drop off the radar after they start contraception? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a quick add on. I think uh, fundamentally is to understand why would they drop off, right? So is it true? Because education or awareness are not sufficient enough. And, and truly, it's really about how we actually engage uh, you know, the, the women you know, throughout the journey and through what we always call the 3E, right? As first, how we empower them. Right. And second, how we encourage them during the journey. And the third E is how we actually enforce they need to take on a daily basis, things like that. So this is how I think we can actually, you know, continue to improve the compliance to the contraceptive pills. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, can I ask Jack Shen a final quick question? You mentioned patient-centred care where doctors and pharmacists need to work together. What do you believe is the first step they can take and how do they ensure the doctor-pharmacist relationship is optimised for better patient outcomes? Hi, thanks, Tina, for the question. Um, I think the first thing is communication. Um, in the um, in the many Western countries, um, there are very clear lines of communication between the pharmacist and the doctor that needs to be established, um, and that's actually very important. Um, and um, on top of that, maybe we, what we can do is we get the pharmacy societies and and uh, the doctor societies to sit down and and work out a workflow. So once you have a workflow in place beforehand that actually improves the way uh, um, things are managed and uh, technology again is a very good enabler for that because if everything's on a uh, on a digital platform which the workflow is already in place that will make the communication a lot easier and um, the experience to uh, the patient a lot better mm -hmm. terrific well said thank you very much well, guess what? That's where we have to leave our Q&A right now. Sadly, thank you to our wonderful panellists for your fabulous insights today. And this is where, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye. And thank you for joining us from all corners of our wonderful region. Thank you so very, very much as we wave goodbye to all of our panellists. And thank you to our participants, our guests. Um, I hope that you've come away from this event richer in knowledge inspired by our speakers and energised to really make a difference in your own capacity. Please stay on for a few minutes longer as we uh, show you some really exciting videos to close with. But remember too that together we can collaborate to make sure that nobody is left behind and help women take control because we really do know that women in all parts of our region need to be supported in making the best informed decisions about her health, planning her life life, planning her family as well. And let's work together to empower women with our networks, with our expertise and the innovations for the next COVID decade and, of course, beyond. Thank you so very, very much for being with us. Take care and please stay with us now for our final messages. From me, bye for now.
ันนะคะการคุมกําเนิดเนี่ยควรจะเป็นความรับผิดชอบทั้งสองฝ่ายนะคะไม่ว่าจะเป็นฝ่ายชายหรือฝ่ายหญิงนะคะที่จะต้องมั่นใจว่าการมีเซ็กในครั้งนี้ปลอดภัยไม่ว่าจะเป็นการใช้วิธีการคุมกําเนิดเพื่อป้องกันการตั้งท้องโดยที่ยังไม่พร้อมหรือการติดเชื้อจากการมีเพศสัมพันธ์ค่ะแกแบงเอ้ยหายเงยนิวฮอนหายดอกนิวฮอนหายเงียงกู้นิวฮอนเดี๋ยวตีมแรดูกิฟุ่มฟับปูหอกไปนูเก่าและดูเก่งหินใต้ของแกแบงฮัลโหลมายนามส์คริสติน่าและฉันจากออสตินเท็กซัสฮัลโหลฉันคือทวีสฉันอยู่ที่กรุงเทพมหานครฉันคือยีนจากมาเนลล่าบอนจูฉันคือพอลฟิลิปเกสันจากเมืองพิเศษ Hola, soy Pamela Moreno y soy de México. Hi there, my name is Jacqueline from Tanzania. Let's talk about contraception. Yo creo que el anticonceptivo es lo más importante del autocuidado porque va más allá de solo decidir cuándo y cuándo no tener hijos, sino también de cuidarte en contra de enfermedades e infecciones de transmisión sexual. Contraception is not only for adults or married people. I feel very lucky to have access to these methods because it means that I can pursue my dream of becoming a professor one day, and I don't have to worry about an unplanned pregnancy. Whether you are sexually active or you are not, you need to know the different types of contraceptive methods that we have out there, and the importance of contraception in our modern day society. Le positif féminin et masculin. Le taux de thai, hàng ngày. Est-ce que l'hormonal est le corps et le plâtre? Implants. Phòng nhà cung cấp nợt. L'accès aux contraceptifs. Injectables. You know, being in a country like Singapore, which is rather conservative. It's a bit hard to have these conversations, but I think these conversations are important. It can create awareness and it could also educate you. Conocí la educación sexual, digamos que un poquito tarde cuando me casé. Me casé también muy joven, a los 21 años. Realmente vengo de una familia muy católica y de un colegio muy católico en donde el tema de educación sexual creo que no se toca. Por, por la religión, porque pues de cierta manera nos educan para que lleguemos vírgenes al matrimonio, por lo cual la educación sexual la empecé a implementar, investigar con mi pareja, con mi esposo, eh, a los 21 años. Và học về cái cách sử dụng đeo ba cao su Và đặc sắc nhất là khi mình thật sự có những cái tò mò về mặt giới tính á, Thì mình cũng không thể trao đổi với bạn bè đồng lứa được Và mình cũng không thể nói chuyện với ba mẹ được Anh chị thì cũng không có luôn Cho nên thành ra là mình chỉ có chị Google làm bạn thôi However, I still think that there is a lot of shame around it Especially at home and in school It's definitely not something that we can just casually talk about país muy machista y muy tabú acerca de la sexualidad, sobre todo con gente más joven y adolescentes, aunque seamos honestos, van a seguir teniendo relaciones. El chiste es darle las herramientas para que puedan tomar buenas decisiones. Todavía algunas personas tienen esta creencia de que debes de tener los hijos que Dios te mande, lo cual le quita absolutamente todo el poder a la mujer sobre su propio cuerpo y sobre el momento de decidir si es que quiere llegar a tener hijos, deja tú si quiere muchos. Entonces, todavía nos falta mucha información y muchísima educación acerca de la planeación familiar en México. In the northern parts of Nigeria, um, contraceptive uptake is greatly affected by religious beliefs. As well as misconceptions about contraceptive use, even people who do have access may feel bogged down by social stigmas, like birth control makes you infertile or it makes you more promiscuous. And these are just not true. They help you pursue your dreams and let you discover the world on your own before you decide to have a kid one day. Sexual rights and sexual ration are taboo topics in most of Tanzanian cultures. Girls who seek contraception are usually linked to promiscuity, and because of that, they face resistance to access these kind of services, especially when they need them the most.
Deutschland, würde ich sagen, ist äh, ja, so ein Bildungsmittel generell sehr leicht zu bekommen ähm, für Frauen unter 22. Es ist die Pille zum Beispiel komplett kostenfrei äh, und auch sonst in jedem Kiosk an der Ecke bekommt man auch Kondome. Also ist das recht gut zugänglich, würde ich sagen. I think it depends on what kind of contraception we're talking about. The pill is quite easy to get, however, not a lot of people know about that. And it's not something that is just advertised either. However, the issue really is not a lot of people know. Contraception is only as accessible as we are informed. Ben kesinlikle aile planlamasının ve doğum kontrolün kadınları güçlendirdiğini düşünüyorum. Sonuçta kendi hayatları olduğu için daha büyük bir söz hakkına sahip olduklarını düşünüyorum. Eee siento que en el caso de las mujeres nos empodera demasiado a tomar las riendas de nuestra vida y decidir en qué momento hacerlo o no hacerlo, cuidarnos, respetarnos, eso es lo más importante. Samla bim la na kha ben kit wa kan kum gam nen ne tam hai bu yin bab la na kha mi sit lueok ti sa mi luk dai duoy ta eng nai vela ti mao som. It would be to find the birth control method that works for you, because it is not as scary as people make it seem. Je pense que tous, autant que nous sommes, devons avoir un accès libre aux informations liées à la contraception, et surtout, nous devons avoir un accès sans limite aux méthodes de contraception, sans barrières géographiques et sociales. So if you are considering taking birth control pills, just do take note that different people react to medications differently. Um, there are side effects for all medications, but you may or may not experience it. Jen xin tặng từ trong trái tim của mình gửi đến tất cả các bạn trẻ ở Việt Nam. Your life, your choice. Cái cuộc sống này của các bạn là sự lựa chọn của các bạn, cho nên hãy có trách nhiệm với nó. Hãy có trách nhiệm với chính bản thân của mình. Happy World Contraception Day.